So I hope you can see my screen. I'm sure you can see my screen at this point. No, sir. No, sir. We can't see anything. Can't see anything. My screen. No, sir. We can't see it. OK, OK, no problem. I understand. You can see it now. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. We can see it, sir. OK. At least, so if you have issues, I would, I would look at your chats. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are going to be looking at uh, some topics relating to buffers and buffer systems. We can't we can't talk about buffer systems without discussing the components of buffers. And you all agree with me that the two main components of buffers are the acids or the salt of the conjugate base, or the base and the salts of their conjugate acids. So we are going to be looking at water. Water, which is uh, a molecule that has both properties of acid and base. We we'll use it as a example to define some terms. So we are going to be looking at the definition of acid and base. We all know the pH scale from one to fourteen. And uh, you know the essence of the pH scale to represent the pH of different solutions in uh, discernible forms. So there are instruments for pH measurements. Uh, one of the major instruments is the uh, digital uh, pH meter. You also have the Anderson Cell batch equation, which is a very important equation in uh, acid-base chemistry. It it's, uh, shows the relationship between pH, pKa, and the concentration of the conjugate base to conjugate acid. So it's a very important uh, uh, equation. You have a relationship between pH, pOH, um, hydrogen ion concentration, hydroxide ion concentration, the ion product of water, and pKa, a term called pKa which is used to um, assess the strength of some acids. So water and their properties, we know that water is regarded so as the prominent chemical component of living organisms. You find it in all living organisms. It is very important because it has solvating ability. It's able to uh, uh, solvate a wide variety of organic and inorganic molecules. Water molecules form dipoles. Uh, the structure of water molecule essentially indicates that water exists as a dipole. It has uh, two poles. One is the positive uh, pole, while the other is the negative pole. So, and that's also uh, is one of the major defining uh, factor in the behavior of water. So you have the uh, two load pairs of electron on the oxygen atom. The hydrogen atoms are able to draw 
um, the oxygen atom draws electron cloud to itself while it leaves the hydrogen atom uh, with less uh, electron cloud and um, ends a partial positive charge while the oxygen atom confers on itself a partial negative charge due to the electron uh, the electronegative electron cloud around it. So you have a dipole there. So the hydrogen atoms are forming one end of the pole while the uh, oxygen atoms uh, is on the other side of the pole. So what are molecules form hydrogen bonds? Hydrogen bonds, essentially, hydrogen bonds form between uh, water molecules where the oxygen group, the oxygen group with its partial negative charge has a sort of, um, a sort of ionic interaction, you know, a negative positive interaction with opposing, opposing um, hydrogen atoms from another water molecule. So you have hydrogen bonds between uh, water molecules and these are very important bonds. Even though they are not strong like the covalent interactions, they are non-covalent interactions, but they give water molecule its characteristics behavior, um, the, the, some of the physical properties attached to water molecules are from these hydrogen bonds, which are small non-covalent interactions that pull up together because of the large amount of water molecule we find being held together. So the hydrogen bonds are quite important. So you have um, each, uh, each water molecule is hydrogen bonded to at least four other uh, water molecules as shown in this uh, diagram. So you also have water molecules being able to uh, donate a proton and they're also able to accept protons. So if they're able to donate a proton, they behave like an acid. If they're able to accept protons, they, they behave like bases. So water molecules have that ability because they're able to behave like acid and base, they're, they're, they're referred to as amphoteric uh, substances. And in, in, in synthesis reaction, water molecules are mostly given off. They're mostly given off and in trying to dissolve um, bonds too, in trying to break bonds such as the peptide bonds, the glycosidic linkage, water molecule can help break bonds by uh, giving off its hydrogen to uh, one of the components of the bond and giving off its hydroxyl group to the other component of the bond. So you have that hydrolysis reaction. Water molecule is able to perform hydrolysis reaction. It is also a product of synthesis reaction. So essentially, if two water molecules react, you have the Hydroxium, um, the, the hydroxonium ion on one side, and then you have the hydroxide ion on the other side being formed. Now, a water molecule, a water molecule has its own peculiarities. One of the peculiarities is that water molecule, the probability that water molecule will exist Um, the probability that a water molecule, the, uh, a water molecule will exist or would ionize, the probability that it will ionize in solution is just about one in a billion. It's about one in a billion. So if we extrapolate, we could get the hydrogen ion, uh, the hydrogen ion concentration to be about 10 raised to the power minus seven molar. The hydroxide ion concentration to uh, would be about 10 raised to the power minus seven molar, while the, the concentration of water molecule itself, the molar concentration of water molecule itself is 55.56 uh, mole per liter. Now, for this reaction where water molecules react to give the hydrox uh, hydroxonium ion and the hydroxide ion, the equilibrium, the equilibrium, the equilibrium of that reaction or uh, the equilibrium constant of that reaction will be uh, equal to the products, which are the ions uh, being generated from the reaction of two water molecules. So 
the the equilibrium constant will be the uh, uh, product concentration over the uh, reactant concentration. The reactant here is the water molecule. So if we find the if we find the K equilibrium of the reaction in which water molecules dissociate, that uh, K equilibrium or the equilibrium constant will be 10 raised to power minus seven multiplied by 10 raised to power minus seven over 55.56 molar. Now, what this, what this tells us is that the equilibrium constant for the dissociation of water molecules into, it, into its component ion is very small. It is 1.8 times 10 raised to the power minus 16. So, more per liter. That is very small. What it implies is that water molecules don't dissociate readily. It indicates that water molecules don't dissociate what readily. So a lot of um, for for each water molecule is just uh, also for about a billion water molecule is just one that dissociates into its component ions. So the equilibrium constant tells us the rate, um, uh, the uh, the extent to which the reaction has gone to the right or to the left. So if you're talking about to the right, it's the product formation. So for product formation now, that means a K equilibrium of 1.8 times 10. Olamide Akin, please be extremely careful. Now, the equilibrium constant for uh, dissociation of water molecule, which is about 1.8 times 10 raised to power minus 16, indicates that, indicates that just few of the products has been produced from a uh, water molecule. That means few of uh, the water molecule has been ionized. So now the equilibrium constant, from the equilibrium constant, we could also infer another term, which is the ion product of water. If we, if we do a cross multiplication, the ion product of water, as the name implies, will be the um, the multiplication of both concentration of hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion. So the ion product of water essentially is 1.0 times 10 raised to the power minus 14 mole per liter square. Now the the ion product of water can be used to define the term pH plus pOH equals 14. If we if we um, convert those terms to logarithmic, we could get the term pH plus pOH equals 14. That one is quite easy to do. If you, um, if you uh, find the log to base 10 of both sides, you could get the term pH plus pOH is equals to 14. That means the relationship between pH and pOH is that for, um, for a solution, the pH for that solution and its pOH is equal, for, is equal to 14. And what that implies is that you're able to determine the pH if you know the pOH or the hydroxide ion concentration. And the pH is a term, is a term used to define the hydrogen ion concentration. pH is essentially the negative log of hydrogen ion concentration. We've, uh, we must have learned that severally along the line. Now, the pH for pure water, for pure water at 25 degree uh, Celsius is, is just about seven. That is a neutral pH. So pure water is expected to have a pH of seven. Lower than seven, you have, it becomes, it goes more acidic, it goes lower. Now, going higher than seven to 14, it becomes more uh, basic. So acids, as defined by um, uh, Bronsted, are proton donors. Protons are hydrogen ions. So a proton donor is able to give up its hydrogen ion, while bases are proton acceptors. It's a more acceptable term for defining acids and bases. Now, the strong acids are those acids that will completely dissociate into anions and cations, even in strongly acidic uh, solutions. 
that means at low pH, they are still able to uh, give off, uh, they, are, they are still able to dissociate very uh, strongly. Now, while the weak acids, on the other hand, are those ones, are those ones that are only able to dissociate partially in solutions, in acidic solutions or in solutions. Now, strong bases, on the other hand, too, are those which are completely uh, um, uh, dissociated at high pH, while the weak bases, or strong bases are those that would completely dissociate at high pH, while the uh, weak bases are not able to uh, dissociate readily at high pH. Now, the implication of that is that for something to behave very well like an acid, it should be able to readily give up its uh, proton. For it to behave readily as a base too, it should be able to readily accept proton. So those are uh, terms that we would talk about briefly when we, when we discuss um, um, buffers. Now, the pH scale. The pH scale is as defined. If we look at the concentrations that we we'll get for hydrogen ion, mostly they're quite uh, minute numbers. So to represent them in a, a form, in a form that would be easily, um, easily correlated or easily understood, the pH scale was developed. So the pH scale, the pH scale is able to convert those minute numbers into more, um, more concrete numbers. So a pH or uh, an hydrogen ion concentration of about 10 raised to power zero, which essentially is one molar has a pH of zero. That's with about 10 raised to power minus one molar concentration to is able to be converted into a pH of one. So you have that uh, scale. So, so the expression POH is also sometimes used to describe basicity. So you use it to define or to describe hydroxide ion concentration of the solution. So, so POH like pH is the negative log of hydroxide ion uh, concentration. So it, it is analogous to the expression for pH and know that in all cases, pH plus pH is equal to 14. So an instance here is um, what will be the pH of a solution whose hydrogen ion concentration is 3.2 times 10 raised to the power minus four mole per liter. So the pH here can be calculated simply as the negative log of the, hydrog uh, the hydrogen ion concentration. If you find that the pH will be 3.5. From here, you could also find the P, uh, POH or oxide ion concentration for this particular solution using the term pH plus POH equals 14. Now, uh, we, we, could, we could use the ion product of water, like I said earlier, to define the association between pH and POH, which is pH plus POH equals 14. So if you're going to solve some solutions where the where the um, the pH is known or the pH is unknown and you know the hydroxide ion concentration or you know the hydrogen ion concentration you could always use this uh, formula so essentially the significance excuse me Now, what is the significance of, excuse me, what is the significance of, okay, let me use this. So the significance of PK, as the name implies, I mentioned earlier that 
So functional groups that are weak acids have great physiological significance. Now, if you look at a functional group, weak acids, weak acids are able to dissociate um, partially. So if they're able to dissociate partially, they are functional groups. The functional groups of um, the functional groups of say carboxylic acids are weak acids. And we already mentioned that weak acids are not able to give up their uh, protons readily. Now, because they are not able to give up their proton readily, they, they, serve, they, serve, they serve as buffers mostly because of their, the, the presence of the presence of both the um, uh, a minute amount of the ions, the, since they don't readily dissociate, that means they would not contribute too much to increasing the pH. And they are also there to also um, mop up hydrogen ion concentration. So the, 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 the functional groups, that's the carboxylic groups in weak acids, serve that buffering uh, ability because of their nature. Because of their nature, they are able to help uh, resist changes in pH. They will not contribute, when they ionize, they will not contribute too much to the um, reduction in pH. That's from the protons that are, uh, that, that has been produced. They would also not, they would also help to mop up um, excess hydrogen ion in solution. So they tend to serve buffering, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, they, have, they have the buffering ability. So now, Apart from, apart from the carboxylic groups too, amine groups too, protonated amine groups too have buffering capacities. The, uh, uh, the, the, basic, the basic groups too, they are able to take up, the amine group is able to take up a proton and become uh, protonated. It is also able to uh, give off that proton and uh, become deprotonated. So the, those, functional groups, they have their characteristics, uh, PKA. PKA, I'll define PKA as the negative log of KA. What is KA? KA, KA is the um, equilibrium constant for the dissociation of an acid. Now, what do we expect of the dissociation of a weak acid? We expect that a weak acid like water molecule, a weak acid will have a very small KA because just minute amount is existing as a product over so much reactants. So the KA is expected to be what? To be very small or low. So when you have a low, when you have a low KA for a weak acid, by the time it is extrapolated into pKa, the negative log of the Ka would be uh, a bit on the higher side. So for inversely, it will, you expect an inversely proportional relationship. So for strong acids or a stronger acid that has a higher Ka, that means the pKa will be what? Will be low for that, and like I said, the pKa is able to denote the strength of an acid. So for weak acids, for weak acids, or for a weaker acid, the pKa will be high. For a stronger acid, the pKa will be low. So weak a weak acid will have a high pKa. A, strong, a stronger acid, it could be a weak acid, but it's stronger, it's stronger. So it will have a low pKa. So the lower the pKa, the stronger the acid is. 
the lower the pKa, the stronger the acid is. The lower the Ka, the lower the Ka, the weaker the acid. The stronger the acid, I'm oh, sorry, the, the lower the pKa, the stronger the acid is. But the the higher the um, the sorry the the lower the pKa. So when you have a low pKa, that means you have a stronger, a relatively stronger acid. When you have a high pKa, it is a relatively weaker acid. And I told you that the weaker acids have buffering capacity. So the pKa 